Barber, and uh, pleasure to be here. I had a lovely dinner down at Rustica, um, and I'm on my way to Holland, so this is wonderful. I retired in 2004. Can you all hear me? Okay. I retired in 2004, and um, you know, you sort around to find some things that might be interesting to do. And I went to a talk at the public library uh, some, of a woman who'd published a book about uh, 19th century Ann Arbor. And uh, I said to her, I said, well, this is fascinating. You know, I said, well, how can I get involved in this? And she says, go down to the historical society and volunteer. So I did. And uh, the lady that talked to me found out what I did for a living, which was that I was a teacher of English and history. And um, she wanted to know if I could research. And I thought, well, I have all this education, surely I can. But I didn't know anything about, really, about Michigan or local history or anything like that. And uh, after eight years, this is what I have, this book. Um, it has quite an extensive bibliography in the back. That's pretty much what took a lot of those eight years, was just uh, getting to the point where I felt confident about what I was saying. Um, and as I was telling Beth, there's, there's no book like it. I mean, that's, I'm not, you know, I'm not bragging. There simply isn't a book like it, uh, especially for the Midwest. Every study about um, women's employment in the 19th century was done on the East Coast. Now, my examples are from my county, which is Washtenaw County, but it would be the same just about anywhere, unless you went into the Deep South, and then it would be a, a, a different story. But as long as you're in Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Iowa uh, Ohio, any of those states, I think that this, uh, uh, the national backdrop for this would be the same for all of them. Um, uh, by the way, I don't mind if you ask questions, uh, if, if you'd like to. The name of the book is called A Purse of Her Own. It was a phrase that Susan B. Anthony uh, said, and it's sort of ironic because Susan B. Anthony did not have any money of her own. Her father had gotten into financial difficulties, and among all of the women that were part of the suffrage movement, she's the one who was self-educated um, rather than going to uh, schools. And uh, anyway, my mother used to say the same thing. A woman should have a purse of her own, her own resources, uh, should she need them. Now, the problem, of course, is the old joke that history is his story. He wrote it about himself. And, uh, and it's really quite true. Um, they didn't keep records about what the women were doing. Her story uh, has basically been ignored, eliminated, or distorted beyond recognition. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, one of the problems when you go to the primary documents of the period is that uh, they've ex excluded the women. This is the uh, Ann Arbor uh, City Directory, which had what they called the business mirror, which is the yellow pages. And you see here where it says that this collection of, of information has the name of every businessman in the city. There were also two dozen women listed in it. But you can see that if you didn't scrounge, uh, you might just take this as being true. One of the ladies mentioned it was Olive Coe. Uh, she was a milliner, came from uh, Ohio to Michigan, stayed in Michigan about 20 years. And uh, at the Ypsilanti Historical Society, they have this absolutely scrumptious hat that she uh, made. One of the most revealing things, I guess, about myself as well as anyone else is that I read the uh, History of Washtenaw County. It's pro published by the Chapman Company. And it wasn't until the second time I read it that it, I, it dawned on me, because it said that, oh, there were so many Coopers in this Cooper shop, so many men were at the sawmill, so many uh, uh, men were at the uh, grist mill. And when it got to the textile mill, it said there were so many hands. And, you know, I taught English writing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we tell kids to vary their word choice. And probably yeah, that's what I thought the first time. But, oh, no, guess what? Those hands were female. 
What really makes me upset is when I get absolute unsupported falsehoods. This one comes from a major museum here in Michigan. And it was an uh, a, uh, exposition on women. And the first thing I saw was this big sign that said, women in the 19th century could neither attend university nor practice law. So I emailed a gal I knew who was a curator there, and I said, you know, I saw this. And I said, of course they could. I said, would you like me to send you sources? And she said, no, I know they can. Now, I never paid my money again to drive over there and pay the fee and go in and see if they changed it. I have this horrible feeling they didn't. And everyone left thinking this was true. What we've been given are stereotypes. I'm asked, what have you learned in eight years that it took to write this book? My answer is nothing we have been told is really true. Nothing. You can find such people, but they aren't representative of what women were doing at that time. The stereotype tends to be an upper class, uh, male-oriented stereotype, um, not of, uh, well, they just, just didn't include anybody who was uh, making trouble is what they would think it was by doing something that wasn't uh, uh, what they were supposed to be doing. I love etymology. I, I looked stereotype up in, a, in the uh, Oxford English Dictionary and it tells me that it is a printing plate. So this is Elizabeth Ellett's Women of the West, which I recommend to you. It's a wonderful book. Uh, they, it's in reprint now. Um, anyway, it was stereotyped. In other words, that was the thing the printer used. And you can sort of see how we've gone from that to what we are, have today, um, which actually the way we think of a stereotype was not used until 1922. But I think that this uh, sentence by Walter Lippmann really tells you what a stereotype is. That it seems so real, it's like a biological fact. But it's not. You know, we all know that. So we're going to talk about some myths. Don't want you to myth it, right? <laughs> anyway. One of, uh, one of the things um, I've heard is that women only worked out of desperation. Have you heard that? I think that's a pretty common myth. No one is more desperate than an ex-slave. Mary Roper and her husband Ben uh, were born into slavery, came north uh, after the Civil War, and uh, they opened up uh, a barber shop. A lot of barbers were black. The vast majority were African American. Anyway, uh, she lived 38 years longer than her husband, and um, this is the stone she bought for her husband, and those two little ones on the left are for their children who, who did not survive beyond babyhood. And uh, um, she worked because she needed the money, no question about it. And the, real, the really sad part about Mary Roper is that her name is not on this tombstone. Someday I'm going to go to Dexter, Michigan, and I'm going to pay for her name to be put on this tombstone, because when she died, there was no one left to do it for her. However, saying that, that some, a lot of women worked out of need, a lot didn't. That's the part that's gotten left out. Helen McAndrew uh, came from Baltimore to Ypsilanti, Michigan, and she uh, went to medical school in the 1850s when regular university medical schools would not take a woman. And so a lot of women went to the alternative medical uh, schools, and she did that. And she paid her way through school uh, by doing bookbinding, which was another popular uh, occupation for women. Um, and then she came back to Ypsilanti and to, to practice medicine. And nobody but the African Americans and the women would come to her uh, until one of the bigwigs in town, his wife, was, had been ill. He'd brought doctors from Ann Arbor. He'd brought doctors from Detroit. Nobody knew what to do with his wife. And the gardener said, why don't you call Dr. McAndrew? You know, she's, had, she's a pretty good doctor. So he did. And within a week, uh, Dr. McAndrew had the wife up and walking around. So um, her, her uh, reputation was made. Uh, her son, though, uh, when, when uh, later in her life, he th people said, well, what, how'd you feel when your mother left you as a toddler to go off to school and learn to be a doctor? 
And he says, my mother had a gift. He says, anybody can cook and clean. Myth two. If a woman worked, they did only menial or traditionally female jobs. Answer, a lot of them did. <laughs> no question about it. They worked in canning factories. Uh, they were milliners. Uh, Phoebe and Catherine Hook are a mother and a daughter uh, that were in the millinery business for more than 50 years. They taught rural schools. Bless them for doing it because they turned out uh, you know, functionally literate country. And later in the century, they were uh, telephone operators. Did, men were telephone operators at first, but they didn't take to it very well. And so they switched to women. Uh, this girl, Maggie Sharp, uh, she was from Ypsilanti and then Ann Arbor. Uh, she was also a telegraph um, person. <laughs> I can't say telegraph man, can I? And uh, of course, one of the first uh, things that a housewife would jettison, if she could, was laundry. Send it out, let someone else do it. Bring them in and let them do it here, but get it out of my uh, list of things I have to do. And uh, so you can see from this that uh, there were quite a few women in that as we started to get big steam laundries. And there were women who owned laundries too. I have found women who were black, a blacksmith, a brick maker, taxidermist, house painter, a barn cleaner. Not just once in a while, this is what they did. To, uh, to pay the bills. This, well, we've heard this, boy. Well, they only worked until they got married because everybody wanted to be married, right? It's absolutely true. Susan Speechley, uh, until she married, uh, was a photographer. How many photographers do you think there were in the United States? Women, professional photographers, say about 1880. Any guesses? Oh, come on. They're just recording this. <laughs> 25. 25. We're going to have to go higher than that. Nine hundred and seventy-three, according to the U.S. Census. Nine hundred and seventy-three professional photographers, women. This uh, young lady, she started out in Ann Arbor where her family lived. And then she bought uh, out a retiring photographer his business in Manchester, Michigan. And uh, so she had these two. Um, Manchester is kind of a sleepy little bedroom community now, but it was quite a vital uh, economic thing at the time. And uh, she gave it up when she married. So that's true. But what nobody tells you is that the last three decades of the 19th century had the greatest number of unmarried women in the entire history of the United States. One woman's journal that I read, she said, oh, she had eight proposals. She says, but no one was really quite good enough for me. <laughs> so she never did get married. Um, yes? Did it have something to do with uh, all the men killed in the Civil War? Absolutely. We managed to kill 700,000 or more in the Civil War. That cut down the population quite a bit. But I think the bigger problem was a lot of them were going west, and they were going west alone. One of the big differences between Michigan history and our conception of the west is that Michigan was settled by families, and not the idea that you went out as a cowboy or a, you know, a fur trapper or something, and then you brought women in. Uh, that was definitely more like Colorado and that, that uh, you know, the Rockies and that sort of area. I uh, had the best fun with this Elmira F. Lovell. Um, uh, she was in the, the uh, business mirror. I found her right away, but I didn't know anything about her. So I started learning how to do genealogy, and I found out that uh, on Amazon, on uh, what is it called? Ancestry.com, that uh, her father was a judge in Flint. And I thought, well, why would she open up a store in Ann Arbor if her father's a judge in Flint? And then, of course, you have the little aha moment. And I put on my jacket, and I drove over to the Bentley. And sure enough, she, went, so she had graduated from the University of Michigan. So had her two sisters. And she had a uh, shop right here on North State Street, right at the building that uh, we're looking at. And um, uh, 
she innovated by selling, well, she had a tea house, she had a, a dry cleaners, I mean, she had a bunch of little businesses, but the thing that really makes her stand out is that she started doing collegiate souvenirs, calendars, pennants, mugs with U of M on it. And uh, she ended up going east and she taught in a business school. One sister of hers, all three were graduates of U of M, one went to uh, Turkey to teach and, and, and uh, you know, as a missionary. And the other, she died, by the way, of typhus, I think. Uh, and the other sister was a college professor. <laughs> so, uh, oh, and oh, the other interesting thing was that uh, there's no F in her name. Uh, she said that she, she did put the F in because she wanted to distinguish herself from her aunt that she was named after. There are actually were uh, eight Elmira Lovells in Michigan at this time. And she had just, she says arbitrarily picked up the F. I don't believe it. I think somewhere in her subconscious, F is for Flint, where she came from. Uh, so Emma Edmonds, she did the same thing. Uh, she signed up as Frank Flint Thompson for the Civil War because she was at the time of the recruiting, she was living in Flint. So I think this is the same, but I don't, I can't really tell you. There's another gal in Ann Arbor. Uh, I think she was married briefly, but I, it didn't take because she was home with, mom, with Mama very rapidly. Uh, and she started buying houses on North State Street and turning them into rooming houses. And these are just three. She had seven or eight uh, at the time, uh, you know, when she started to get older and have to sell them off. The one that most everybody finds kind of interesting is the one on the top right, the White House. That, she gave that to the Sisters of Charity. That is the first St. Joseph's Hospital, <laughs> right there. And it didn't last long. They outgrew it pretty quickly. <laughs> but nobody can believe that that was the first St. Joseph's Hospital. Right across the street is St. Thomas Church. So the Sisters of Charity uh, were affiliated with, of course, St. Thomas Church. Uh, this is North State Street, a, a little bit north of campus, uh, just before you get to the train depot. Yeah, it's just across the street. You can kind of see uh, St. Thomas Church there, way on the right. Uh, Ellen actually lived in the Purple House. Um, anyway, she was considered very astute businesswoman. Uh, if she wanted lumber, you better not cheat her because she'd know it. Um, okay, myth four. Women could not manage business affairs alone. They just don't have the right head for it. Yeah. Well, you probably will recognize this woman. Uh, her name is Laura Haviland. Have you heard of her before? No? She uh, started, she came very early on. She's a Quaker. Uh, she and her husband came uh, to Adrian uh, to farm. And um, her husband, her baby, her mother, her sister, a bunch of them died in the 1840s. There was uh, uh, quite a little epidemic going on. Anyway, when her husband died in 1845, she realized that they had $700 in debt. And so she went to each person they owed money for, uh, to, and she wanted to talk to them about how she could set up a payment plan or what, what, what kind of a deal they could do. And this one man said to her, this is out of her autobiography, uh, he says, you do not think of taking your husband's business and carrying it forward, do you? She said, I thought of trying to do the best I could. Oh, you're very much mistaken, Mrs. Haviland. You can do no such thing. You had much better appoint some man in whom you have confidence to transact your business for you. That guy did not know Laura Haviland. <laughs> she, she did just fine. Yeah. Oh yeah, any kind of prejudice. I mean, we can we can have anyone who's prejudiced against other people. Yeah, it would work the same. Well, except for some prejudice, like Jews, they don't think Jews know how to run business. <laughs> the only the men. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, that's just that's just bigotry. Anyway, if you want a really good read, uh, and you get this one um, in uh, you know reprint. Her autobiography, The Story of My Life, it's called, and it is amazing. The part about what she did in the Civil War will just keep you up reading, honestly. It's, it's wonderful. 
this is a block of buildings in, uh, down at the foreground of that picture uh, in Ann Arbor, and it's called the Hoban Block. And uh, just about everybody in Ann Arbor thinks that Mr. Hoban built that block. Well, no, no, no. Mr. Hoban was a farmer. And uh, when he uh, died, well, he came in the last part of his life into Ann Arbor. A lot of people gave up farms, you know, when they got to be uh, elderly. Anyway, but it was his wife, after he died, his widow, who built this block of offices and stores and things. And then she rented them for an income. She was a, a landlord. 20%, one-fifth of the population of Ann Arbor were women in the top uh, tax bracket. Oh, I, I misspoke. One-fifth of the people in the top tax bracket were women. Um, and this woman was even wealthier than the previous one. Um, her name's Olivia Hall, obviously. And when her husband died, and he had been in real estate, so she, I'm sure she learned a lot from him, uh, she bought up some land, and she had it platted. Uh, you can still go into the records and see this plat. She actually did it twice, but this is the first one. And she built a subdivision. And the thing that made her subdivision different, and why it's still highly coveted, is that she insisted that all houses be 60 feet back from the street. Before that time, most of the houses come right up to the sidewalk. And it gives it a very elegant kind of feel. This is Burns Park in Ann Arbor. And it's still, uh, people pay a lot to live in Burns Park, even though the houses are small by modern standards. Uh, it's also very close to the university. But uh, it's a very coveted uh, neighborhood. Oh, and this is the woman, this woman uh, gave uh, Susan B. Anthony land. Knowing that Susan B. Anthony had no money, uh, she gave her some land that she could sell and have some money of her own. Because, ironically, she didn't have a purse of her own. All right, this is number five. I, I bet you've heard of this one. Once a woman marries, she didn't work. You've heard that? No? Yeah? Um, it's amazing to me how many women started out teaching and gave it up rather rapidly. Um, if you went to Michigan State Normal School, you had to promise to teach in the state of Michigan for two years. And uh, there's just tons of women in my book that went to the normal school, did their two years, and then found something else to do with their lives. <laughs> anyway, one was Elvira Clark. She lived in Chelsea, Michigan. And uh, she opened, started a big greenhouse and she would take her flowers to the farm market, and she had a shop. And people said, well, why don't you have a shop in Ann Arbor? Because, uh, you know, they like your flowers too. And that is where the Chelsea Flower Shop came from. It's right there on Liberty Street. Uh, everyone goes downtown, sees it, but they don't know why it's called the Chelsea Flower Shop. Uh, she eventually got married to Mr. Wiesel, and uh, that didn't interfere at all with her uh, her flowers and her shops. She just kept on doing it. In fact, the woman I interviewed at, when I went in one day had worked there since the, the woman I talked to was about 14. And when she started, Mrs. Wiesel was running the shop. Still. Now, as we said, a lot of barbers were African American. This happens to be a Caucasian lady. I don't think she was in this field until she married. I couldn't I, I didn't find anything that would indicate that. So after she married Mr. Trojanowski, uh, he had the barber shop on the first floor, and she set up a women's bathing salon on the second floor, because taking a bath was a huge deal in those days. So uh, uh, it was much easier just to come and pay your money and let somebody else haul all the water, etc. She moved, oh, three or four times. So did, so did her husband, but they didn't always stick together like that. Uh, so she was in business 30 years, at least. And by the time she retired, uh, they were doing pedicures and all kinds of things so that we would recognize today. She didn't stay in the bathing uh, business very long. Now, I think this is the most egregious error that we've had. Wives were not involved in their husband's business. I know my mother tried to get my father to pay Social Security to her for all the work she did for him, for his businesses. He didn't want to do that. 
uh, which is too bad. Um, this is Mae Clark. She was born in Ypsilanti. Uh, she tried teaching for those obligatory two years. And just about the time she was, you know, becoming an adult, she uh, realized that uh, she could go to Cleary Business School. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's what's a huge thing on the east side of the state. We're going to talk some more about it. So she did that, and she became a bookkeeper. Because after the Civil War, when office work was really coming into its own, it was women who did the office work, not the men. And it was a very coveted uh, line of work. It was a white collar, middle class uh, kind of a job. And it was far less demanding than teaching school. Well, the wonderful thing about Mae Clark is that she got a job uh, as the bookkeeper for a guy that came from uh, Ontario. His name was Jefferson Gibson. And uh, she started out as his bookkeeper. Then she became his assistant. Then she became his wife. And then she became his partner. And they are the only married couple I found that advertised as a couple. And uh, she set up another uh, salon in Ypsilanti, but it didn't last because he was hired as the official photographer for the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. So they moved to Chicago. And uh, he's innovated photography studios in department stores. Department stores were just coming about uh, in the 1890s, early 20th century. And he started these, just like you see at Sears, or you know, Olin Mills has all these now. And uh, when he died, she, she took care of the business for another decade or so, and then she sold it. Um, very interesting story uh, for that couple. I, I love this couple, too. They were the first shoemakers in Ann Arbor. Uh, both were German immigrants. He apprenticed in New York. She was a domestic servant. They said when they had $100 apiece, they would marry and uh, come west. And so they did. They arrived in Ann Arbor in the early 30s, 1830s. And uh, again, he got all the credit, but she was doing, uh, he did the, the lower part of the shoe, which is a harder thing to sew, and she did the uppers. And they made enough money that they bought this farm, which their uh, son inherited. And it, it, there's still a road named April. There's still, I worked with a man who was name was, he was a descendant of this couple. Of course, I didn't know it at the time we worked together. But uh, they're quite, they're all over the place over in Washtenaw County. Um, oh, this is one of my favorite. Have you ever been to Ann Arbor? Anybody? No? Oh, well. This is Zingerman's. Zingerman's is, has a national reputation. And they started their, um, they own many businesses now, but this is the original Zingerman's. It's on a corner uh, near Carytown, and uh, this building was built by the Disderidi family. They were immigrants. They ran a little neighborhood store. Mr. Disderidi lived to be over 100, and when he was 100 years old, I think it was 1956 he turned 100. Might have been 57. Anyway, he was interviewed, and uh, the reporter said, well, how do you... Uh, to what do you, uh, you know, accredit your, your span of years? You know, how'd you manage to live so long? And he says, don't work very hard. <laughs> Need I tell you who did all the work? Uh, his wife. Uh, she never learned English, but she was there at the break of dawn, and she was still in that store at 10 o'clock at night. And the daughters worked there, too, uh, you know. Uh, so... Um, they got no credit, though, for it. What's really interesting is the women who continued the businesses once the husband uh, passed away. And it wasn't always a husband. It could have been a father or, you know, whatever. Uh, this woman came from Ohio to Ypsilanti, Michigan, um, with her husband uh, just after the Civil War. And they started, they were both teachers, but they started this uh, photographic studio. And uh, her husband uh, one and one child died um, and she took over the photographic studio. Well, you just don't do that. You know, you had to be doing it with your husband all along. You can't just walk in one day and know how to do it. Uh, so it was tangible evidence that uh, she had been working with him all along. And then finally I found a letter from her uh, to a book that was written, 
and uh, she talked about how we should have more uh, careers available for women than simply millinery and uh, school teaching. She's a good example of how these women juggled family and work. Um, there was a big storm in Ypsilanti and the skylight in her studio was broken and that same day uh, her little toddler who was home with a uh, you know, babysitter uh, fell out of the second story and broke her collarbone. So uh, I had a lot of sympathy for as a working through raising my children that it's not always as easy as some people think it would be. Uh, Katie Rogers is the daughter of Moses Rogers in Ann Arbor who sold agricultural implements. Um, she was an artist. She went and studied in Chicago, graduated first in her class at the Art Institute and came back and was painting portraits and things when her father passed on and she took over his business. I don't think it was what she wanted to do and uh, but she did it long enough that, uh, you know, almost a decade, and then she sold it and went back uh, to painting uh, near the end of her life. Oh, I love this story. Uh, this is Rosa Brooker, and she and her sisters and brother and mother came uh, to Ypsilanti after the father died, and it was uh, Mrs. Shade that uh, paid for them to come. She was uh, their aunt. And two of the, of the girls stayed with the, the Shades uh, in Ypsilanti. And uh, they really were, their name was Brooker, but they went by Shade, even though they weren't legally uh, adopted or anything like that. But uh, first, the uh, uncle died, and um, they had a big building that had a, a tavern and a, a ballroom and their apartments and a store. This was pretty typical of the time and it was called the Shade Block. They also had a pet bear, um, a big bear that they kept in the back, uh, but it died before the husband died. But anyway, and then, then the aunt died and eventually this whole thing came down to Rosa Shade who then married a man named Smith. And the year she died, the building was uh, raised uh, it was, had been condemned in, late in her life. Um, oh, these people have kind of a nifty story, too. Uh, Henrika Spathelf is one of the many, many German immigrants to Michigan, and she married a guy named Lodholtz, and they started a, uh, a grocery store kind of thing. And they had one son. Well, her husband died rather young, like in his 40s. The, the son was quite young still, so uh, Henrika took over the store. When that son grew up, he married Mary Moses. She was from Lansing. I haven't quite figured out how they met yet. I mean, I, I, I can't seem to find that. Anyway, uh, he brought her to town and they had a son. And he died at about 40 when his son was in school and Mary took over the business. So it's like Mary's replicating her mother-in-law's life almost. and. Uh, uh, she also was interesting because she innovated uh, uh, technology into her store by the telephone. And she took orders by telephone and then had people deliver the things to people. Um, this is one of the, her business cards, which I thought was quite lovely. Yeah. Of course, I have all these in my book, you see. When you find out a lot more if you read the book. Um, interesting enough, sometimes it was the wife who died and the husband had to take over. And I have two good examples of when um, they just weren't able to do it. Emma Helber was the uh, daughter of a doctor, a German immigrant in Saline, Michigan. And uh, she went to Michigan State Normal School. She graduated, studied uh, modern languages. And she married the editor of the Saline Observer after they married, they moved to Ann Arbor and they started a German newspaper. There were like 9,000 Germans, German-speaking people in, in the area. And so they started a German newspaper. And uh, I'm pretty sure that she was the brains behind it because she wrote the articles and things. He knew how to print it, distribute it, you know, that kind of thing. And the reason I say that is that uh, she, she died fairly young, uh, possibly uh, some childbirth difficulties because there's a little stone for the baby next to hers. And, uh, but her husband had three more partners and he never could make a go of it. I mean, so 
So I think she was more important to that uh, partnership than a lot of people thought. E even uh, some of the authors from the 19th century who never have anything nice to say about the women have some nice things to say about uh, Mrs. Lessimer. So good for her. This is downtown Whitmore Lake, Michigan. <laughs> And uh, Allie Prey married Mr. Dodge, and they took over the store that he had been running with his mother. And uh, they had uh, quite a few children. Um, and he had started, well, first of all, he became the postmaster. Postmaster is almost always whoever's got the, the business that everybody goes to that they can pick up the mail. And then, uh, so they put it in the store. And then he became, got into the ice business. Whitmore Lake, obviously, is on a lake. And uh, he got into the ice business. And his daughter wrote in her memoir that when the mother died, the father could not keep it all going. The mother had been running the store in the post office, and the father couldn't get, keep it up, and he had to sell the store. So that's one of the few times someone actually said what uh, I'm sure a lot of people thought and did. Um, myth seven. Uh, now we're almost back to that sign in the museum. Women are, were excluded from professional occupations. Well, you can ask what defines professional. Usually it means you got some specific education to do whatever you're doing. The real revolution, this is, I'm going to give a talk uh, at the State uh, Historical Conference in March on women's education, because suffrage wasn't the big thing. Education was. If you look at the people who are worked for the suffrage movement, those women were all well educated. Uh, I don't think they could have pulled it off if they hadn't been. Um, uh, the, the least educated was Susan B. Anthony, and she was self-taught. I love this picture. This is the 1883 uh, liberal arts uh, graduates from the University of Michigan. I love the way the guy posed them with the one with the stripe right there in the middle. So if you go to the University of Michigan, what can you do? Well, for one thing, you can teach more than just uh, rural schools. Um, Alice Porter uh, actually was a little late getting started because she couldn't see. And when she got glasses, finally, she learned she was learning pretty quickly. But for her, early in her childhood, she, she wasn't m moving very fast on that. Um, she taught Latin at Ann Arbor High School for 50 years. There's still the Alice Porter Medal that's given to a senior, graduating senior girl. Marie Kirchhofer, I don't know if she went to Michigan State Normal School, or I can't find anything, uh, but she taught in Manchester. And then she became the principal, which was very unusual. Most of the time, you had female teachers, but a male principal. She was the principal. She gave up her career when her brother's wife died, and she moved to California to raise his daughters. Um, picture of her and the, the niece's uh, Christmas card, photo Christmas card, is on the cover of my book. Uh, the, guy, the man's a gentleman who uh, worked on the book, you know, got it all ready, formatted for publication. Uh, I told him, I said, you've got to take some of those pictures off the front. I said, you can't see the title with all these pictures. And he says, well, I'm not giving up Alice Porter. And I thought, okay, you keep Alice Porter. <laughs> you know, I don't know why he liked Alice Porter so much. Um, Julia Ann King has that stern Germanic kind of look, um, but she is the goddess over at e Eastern Michigan University. Uh, she was the preceptress, uh, which is like a dean of women, sort of. Um, we don't have it anymore. And she t was head of the history department. And she was paid the same as a, a male professor. Uh, and uh, she was there a very long time um, and had a huge influence. I'm going to let you in on one of the best kept secrets there is. This is the first woman to teach at the University of Michigan. Uh, she got her undergraduate. They let women in in 1870. We were talking about Madeline Stockwell a little earlier. Uh, she got her undergraduate degree in 1875 and her graduate degree in 1876. She was offered $2,500 $2, a year if she'd go abroad and start a school for girls. And she turned it down. She married a professor. That's why she turned it down, I think. And she taught at the University of Michigan for $750 a year. 
Uh, she has a national and international reputation in her field, which is microbotany. At the end of the 19th century, you know, natural uh, science was a very big deal. And uh, she, was he she ed edited their, uh, their journal for her, her field. She was on several presidential appointments uh, committees. And uh, she wrote 100 articles. Um, very, very uh, accomplished woman. And she's not mentioned anywhere unless you want to sit down and read the Regents proceedings, which I can't say are very exciting reading. <laughs> But that's where I found her. Um, I love Sophia Hartley. She looks like my maternal grandmother a bit. Uh, she was a German immigrant, came uh, first, I think, to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and then married a doctor in Albion. And uh, uh, when he died, she was 42. She came to the University of Michigan Medical School and uh, took her degree there. And she and her second husband, which Dr. Hartley, uh, they opened up a uh, you know, an office together, and uh, they, she was bilingual, which helped because a lot of the people in Ann Arbor were German-speaking only. They didn't have, weren't fluent in English. Um, and Mary L. Foster, well, let's see, I asked you how many photographers there were in the 1880s. How many female lawyers do you think? Come on, give me a guess. You haven't helped me. A thousand? Mm -mm. How many? How many uh, photographers did you think? Yep. Yeah. You said twenty-five. There's twenty-four. Twenty-four uh, female licensed um, attorneys, and she was the fourteenth one, the first one in Ann Arbor. <laughs> Yeah, they, had, they did a lot with their hair. That was another thing, you know. Uh, I went into one place and I said, have you ever heard of so-and-so? She was a, had a beauty salon, uh, you know, in 1880. And the man that was there said, oh, there weren't beauty salons in 1880. I said, well, of course there were. There were four in this town alone, <laughs> you know. But anyway, yeah, she, uh, she started her law practice in Ann Arbor. And uh, she had four husbands. You know, you always hear about some guy having four wives. She had four husbands. They, they just kept dying. And uh, the other thing that's interesting about her is she was 52 when she went to law school. At 52, I was planning my retirement. Well, this is it. And, uh, uh, but she went to law school, started a whole other career. And uh, uh, there are some articles about her that uh, she left Ann Arbor because uh, she had credit problems. And um, she went to Grand Rapids for a couple months. Then she came back. Everything was fine. She settled it all up. And I had to convince this one guy that, you know, if she had been a man, they wouldn't have mentioned it. But because she was a woman who was going to be the first lawyer in Ann Arbor to open, woman to open an office, uh, they were real, I think the newspaper was really trying to, um, yes, absolutely discredit her. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't think they would have said it otherwise. Oh, yes, this is um, Cleary Business uh, College, which not only offered its students, uh, you know, shorthand and, t and typing and everything, uh, but it also offered women uh, jobs to teach at Cleary College. Uh, Mr. Cleary, he opened it up in 1883, um, and it was just like above a store. <laughs> this, is, this building you see in the middle was uh, about 1893. But when he, when he first started, he... Uh, tried to find places for all his graduates. And he wrote letters to Mr. Hudson down in Detroit, and all these people sent out 80 letters and uh, didn't get any returns. So he had to actually go to Detroit and try to find jobs for these. Um, well, most of them were women, but there were some men. Well, anyway, uh, by in 10 years, he couldn't meet the demand for office help. They were coming to him, and he didn't have enough graduates. I mean, he'd expanded. It just was uh, one of those mushrooming kinds of occupations. All right, myth eight. 19th century women did not participate in politics or receive political appointments. Well, we had this big suffrage thing going on, so it means they weren't included, right? Nope. Emma 
Emma Bauer is from Ann Arbor. Uh, she went to medical school, had a practice for a few years. Her brother had a newspaper. He died. She took over the newspaper, the Ann Arbor Democrat. And uh, then uh, she, uh, well, on the side, not her work, but when she, you know, her private sort of life, uh, she uh, sued uh, the city for not letting women who paid taxes vote in local elections. And that lawsuit, she formed a political action committee, and that lawsuit went to the Michigan Supreme Court. And so because of that, all women in Michigan could then vote in local elections, which means they could serve on the uh, school board. And uh, she was treasurer and then president of the school board. And then she took a job as the head of the Ladies of the Maccabees. Um, you might not have ever heard of them, but it was a, a kind of like the Elks or one of those fraternal kinds of organizations. But primarily it was so they had insurance uh, that would give them money if, if husbands died. Uh, but so it was kind of both of those things. Well, she had a staff of 40. She started out in Ann Arbor, then they went to Port Huron, then Detroit. And then when she retired, she came back uh, to Ann Arbor. There's a nurse who went around to everybody, and uh, she took care of her when she was sick once. And you know, you find these little tidbits in the strangest places. But in this nurse's, uh, it wasn't her memoir. It was really the book she, journal she kept of her patients. I even know the name of her cat. You know, uh, because this woman said, you know, that I'd have tea with her, and the cat would be there. You know, that kind of thing. The story of Frances Stewart is even. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe more representative. Um, she was one of those two-year teachers out of the Michigan Normal School. She came back and was a clerk in the Ypsilanti Post Office. And when the postmaster retired, um, 1,200 citizens of Ypsilanti signed a letter to their congressman, uh, their senator, that she should uh, get the job of postmaster. And that is the correct term. It's genderless. There's no such thing as a postmistress. Even if you read it, it's not a real term. Anyway, so she became the postmaster for Ypsilanti, Michigan. And uh, I was so lucky. Uh, the archives in Ypsilanti, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. And uh, there are two letters in her folder. And uh, they were to her sister when she died, when uh, Frances died. And uh, one was an inspector, a postal inspector, who 20 years earlier had come to uh, Ypsilanti to uh, evaluate the post office and was so impressed with this woman and how she ran her post office that 20 years later he took the time and trouble to notice the name and write to her sister. You have to do a really good job to get someone to do that. Um, and the other letter was a political one that was sent to Francis that said, we don't have any complaints but you have no political clout, and we need to have a man with some clout be postmaster. And you can stay as clerk. Well, I don't know what she said to that, but she left. And she went over to Michigan State Normal School, where she was the one and only, hard to imagine these days, secretary uh, for the university. <laughs> and she did that until she died. And. Uh, uh, but to have those le that letter that just comes right out and tells you, you know, you don't have any clout, you don't have any power, so we're going to get a man in the job. I and mean, you can go back to being a clerk. <laughs> now, this woman is fascinating. Another graduate of the Michigan State Normal School. She taught a couple of years in Ypsilanti. And then she went to Detroit to teach at Professor Skill Stills School for Young Ladies. It was a very, you know, upper class kind of thing. So she went there to teach. And then in Detroit, she was hired by uh, Zebulon Brockway, who had been hired to, for the uh, House of Correction in Detroit. And uh, he's got an interesting autobiography, too, um, because you might not know it, but Michigan was in the forefront of prison reform in the 19th century. We were the first state to ha exclude the death, you know, to ban the death penalty. That was in our 1837 um, Constitution. Well, Brockway brought in teachers. And, uh, and the, the results were stunning and, uh, of how much these, these inmates could learn. And uh, 
Then she became head of the House of Shelter, which was um, like a halfway house, uh, and a very innovative kind of idea. She was then uh, head of the uh, school in Coldwell, Michigan. She was head of the School for the Deaf and the Blind in Flint. And finally, uh, she was made uh, head of the brand new, just opened, uh, Reformatory for Girls. So far, it's a stellar uh, resume. Rockway said, he says, be careful. Be careful, they're going to come after you. Because she was an educator in the broadest kind of terms. Uh, the girls that came to her were sick. They, couldn't, they needed glasses. Uh, they'd been living on the streets. They weren't criminals. They simply were unwanted girls, sort of. And uh, anyway, so one of the issues was that she bought glasses for them. How can you teach them to read if they can't see? Well, the board uh, of directors for the, for the institution, that was the equivalent of $125 today. It was $5 then. But they thought that was a waste of money. She also innovated uh, the cottage system, where 25 girls lived with a woman in a smaller uh, house. And uh, they wanted to have you know, 80 in a big, big building. But the whole point was the, the home-like atmosphere, et cetera. So you know, she and her board <laughs> kind of got uh, on each other's uh, you know, necks, I guess. And they fired her. They fired her. They said she, didn't, she wasn't a good businesswoman. They said she was too sick to do her job. 150 people in, in um, Adrian, no, no, wait, no, in Jackson, no, no, wait, Albion. Adrian, Adrian, <coughs> they uh, took out a, a newspaper ad and uh, they said how, what great things she was doing. Um, I think the most convincing evidence I find, and again, this is, none of this is rock hard, is that when she quit, seven of her employees resigned. You've got to be doing something right to have seven employees resign, you know? Uh, on the other side uh, is that uh, she did die two years later, but her brother, who was a, a physician in Ypsilanti, he said uh, that this whole thing had been such a strain on her, this, this telling her that she wasn't doing the right thing when she was, you know. Um, <coughs> she'd actually gone out west to teach in Albuquerque. <coughs> Excuse me. So I hope we're all going to leave knowing that women did work in the 19th century. Some worked because they needed the money, just like today. Others worked because they wanted independence. And others because it made their lives, it enriched their lives to do whatever they were doing. Someone like um, Jane Addams at Hull House, she, seven years she was almost in a paralyzing depression because she was educated and had nothing to do. And then she found something to do, lived a long life. So have things changed since the 19th century? Well, yes and no. 2009 was the first year that more women were in the workforce than men. <laughs> and 40% of the women in the workforce say that they are the primary breadwinner. They're not doing it just for pin money. They're, they're paying the bills. 62% of all college graduates are women. 60% of the master's degrees are earned by women, but only 49% of doctorates. Now that's kind of interesting. It takes a lot of time to get a doctorate, you know? It does. My students used to ask me why I don't have one, and I said, oh, you know, just too much time. I would, six years probably. Half of the MBAs are earned by women, yet only 16% of CEOs are female. Only 17% of female attorneys are partners. As of 2009, women in the US earned 80 cents to every man's dollar. In Michigan, only 72 cents, making Michigan 44th out of 50, yeah, in pay equity or the lack thereof. 
Younger women are receiving greater pay equity than older women. What group do you think is receiving the highest salaries here in Michigan? Women. They're younger. I'll give you that. Ethnic group. Bingo. Asian professional women. Yeah. But look at this. Here we are, 2014. 96% of secretaries and administrative assistants are women. 95% of child care workers are women. 94% receptionists and information clerks are women. 92% of bookkeepers. 90% of maids and cleaners. 86% of home care aides, you know, like uh, practical nursing and things like that. 81% of elementary teachers and 75% of cashiers. Has it really changed that much? <laughs> Not for the vast majority, apparently. Yet 70% of the women in the United States today say they are not dependent on another's support. At last, they have a purse of their own, which is why I made this title of my book, Purse of Our Own. 